Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I feature a broad range of guests deeply concerned about the environmental issues of our time and more, authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth and for all species help us create sustainable bridges of understanding. These folks are innovators, action-oriented, creating solutions in a variety of ways that honors us and the planet's holistic nature. I am honored to share their stories, their projects, their passion with all of you. And today I'm delighted to introduce you to Kimberly Krusevic, who is the president and founder of InSoil Health, a data analytics and educational consultancy based out of Northeast Ohio. With diverse experience in both healthcare and biological cultivation, Kim brings a unique systems-based approach to current food production challenges driven by the principle that nutrition is the foundation of human health and vitality. Kim works with growers in all walks of life and at all scales to improve food quality using natural biological techniques. By focusing on soil production data, systems improvement, and the human health value proposition, Kim helps growers invigorate the soil food web, reduce input costs, and eliminate the toxic environmental efforts of synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Kim, welcome again to The Holistic Nature of Us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I've invited Kim back because she is working diligently to create bridges of understanding between our growers and our healthcare system. And today we're going to talk more about that bridge that she's creating between soil health, gut health, between growing good quality food and how that relates to creating healthy species, namely the human being. But if we're healthy and the soil is healthy, then all of our species around us have a chance of being healthy as well. So Kim, um, how would you like to begin today with, the, with this uh, very interesting discussion? Well, I, I think it's it's helpful to to just start out by um, by coming to this this common understanding that we as humans are are dependent on our resident microbes, and when these critical associations are broken, problems arise. We have problems with poor health, deficiencies, diseases, um, dysfunctional immune systems, and so forth. So. So when you think about the associations with our microbiome, I mean, there are some things that we can impact and there are some things that we cannot. For example, a lot of our microbiome is formed early in life at birth. We um, are colonized with a, with a good uh, number of microorganisms through the natural birth canal um, and through breastfeeding. So obviously those two uh, areas of exposure so to speak, are, are not areas that we're going to be influencing later in life, but they are very important avenues um, when you consider setting, um, setting individuals and humans up uh, in a good way in terms of having um, excellent colonization of healthy microbiome. So later in life, the two areas that we have an opportunity to influence are through environmental exposure and food. And both of these are, are intimately related to soil and soil health. And this is the area that, um, that I'm interested in, in pursuing and, and optimizing. Oh, that sounds great. Okay, so let's go to the basics. When we talk about um, the microbiome of us at birth, we're really talking about bacteria, correct? When we come into this world as a human being, between the birth canal and our mother, we're actually, um, I'm, I'm going to use the word saturated, but we are actually given um, a boost in microbiomes or bacteria. Am I using those words correctly? Uh, yes, you're, you're basically um, exposed to natural 
flora that that exists. I mean, when we when we talk about the microbiome, there's the, the gut microbiome is obviously one of the major areas of colonization. In fact, it's it's probably the greatest for sure. But we also um, are colonized with healthy and, and beneficial uh, bacteria in our in our mouth, in our nasal passages, and through our genital urinary system. So, um, so all these areas are important. And I, I should have mentioned the skin as well. I mean, the skin is a major source of of colonization, which you know, w- which is interesting because you know when we look at the the hygiene hypothesis and our our over-dependence on alcohol washes and antibacterial soaps, etc. We've really are negatively impacting um, some of these positive, beneficial microbes that we are exposed to, and uh, these these items are, are having um, a negative effect overall on our health because it's destroying both the good guys and the bad guys when you're using these agents. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. I think there's been a body of research coming out to support that as well. We tend to uh, ruin the skin mantle with some of these very, very harsh soaps. So we have to look at some alternatives. But what, what I'm trying to get at here is, is a starting point for my listeners to understand that we're actually more bacteria than we are cells. And that's I find fascinating because I have a nursing background like you do and we were never taught that in our biology we're always taught about you know the lung system the the cardiovascular system we have a series of cells that seem to know what to do but what we're finding out today is that we're actually 10 times more bacteria than we are human cells and that's the piece that you're trying to improve upon in two different Correct. in two different ways, looking at the soil and looking at us as a human species, what does that interface actually mean? Correct. Our intestine alone um, has approximately 100 trillion bacteria. It's an unbelievable number, and and it's not just the number that's important; it's the diversity that's extremely important. And you know, as we go through this conversation today, I think one of the one of the key points uh, that I'd like to convey is that we need to pay attention not just to um, not just to exposing ourselves to um, bacteria in and of itself, but to building a diverse community of bacteria because that diversity is what um, what enhances our resilience uh, and, and improves our ability to fight disease and and, and to promote health. So it's a combination of, of healthy bacteria and healthy bacteria diversity. I agree with you. Um, I've been in the health food industry for a long time, and I've tasted and tried all kinds of probiotics and green foods. And what I found is the ones that seem to work the best are the formulas that contain diverse strains. We're not just looking for something to combat candida yeast, for example, but we're looking for a variety of strains to promote health and well-being. And it's interesting that in a very limited way, our hospitals are getting on board with that uh, because of MRSA and C. diff, you know, very serious superbugs out there that are causing havoc in our hospital communities. So building on that then, Let's look at your soil and how you connect the dot between soil and gut health. Yeah, so you, you bring up a very interesting um, point that, that I'd like to expound on a little bit. You mentioned uh, probiotics, and most people think of probiotics as, as a pill or as fermented food, which are, are both accurate. But, but what people don't realize is that there are thousands of beneficial microbes on the surfaces of fruits, vegetables, and greens um, that come from healthy soil. And although these organisms really don't take up residence because the gut is an anaerobic environment, these are these organisms thrive in aerobic environments, they are considered beneficial transients and they do play an important role in boosting the immunity as they travel through your your intestines and interact with the local bacterial community. What we're learning is that these gut, the gut microbiome has its own communication system and its own early warning system, if you will. So um, when pathogens or diseases 
um, start to emerge, there's a there's communications and signals that go out within the gut to to create um, a, an appropriate response um, to protect the host or the um, the symbiotic host, I should say, the the human. So so healthy food um, that is grown in healthy soil is can 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 be thought of as a very important probiotic, and we should be we should be think, you know you thinking about it that way and and using it. Uh, and consuming it and with that in mind. But what happens when we wash our fruit and vegetables, which we have to do to some extent? Yeah, and, and most vegetables that you purchase at the grocery store has been washed several times. Um, it's been, you know, at least I think five times, but um, you can't really wash off microorganisms completely. You can get a, a certain percentage of, of, of them to, to be washed off, but there's still a, um, there's still an element of colonization. And if you know that the food has been grown in a healthy environment, I mean, you really don't need to be washing them extensively. For example, if you're growing, um, if you're growing your own produce in, in your backyard garden and you know that that soil is healthy and there isn't in contaminants there and, and it's a healthy f- uh, food web, uh, it's actually, you know, it's actually more beneficial probably to to consume that food without major washing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard that too. Um, I, I think there's a company out there that kind of started his program based on probiotics from dirt. Um, and I always thought that there, there was some wisdom to that because if we are farming and if we're growing anything, whether it's a small backyard farm to a huge you know, agricultural farm, we are walking in the dirt. We have got our food hands in the dirt. We brush our skin with dirty hands. We sweat. We pick up the dirt that way. And I don't think we have realized up until recently how beneficial that's been for us uh, as a species. It's a, I agree with you. And there, there's some good uh, research out there. It's, it's actually called the hygiene hypothesis where they've shown that um, children raised on farms that are exposed to, you know, more t- to nature and, and uh, dirt and, and animals, etc., that they actually have fewer allergies than children that are raised in clean, high-end city houses. So there's definitely a benefit uh, to being exposed to uh, diversity, um, microbe diversity through soil and pets and dogs, etc., Mm-hmm. And you and I as nurses know that there's, you know, practicality to all of this too. You know, there's a way of being uh, practically uh, hygienic and there's a way of, of sort of stretching the boundaries of that just a little bit. We don't have to spray every service with Lysol is what I'm getting at Absolutely. Uh, to, be, to be clean and, and uh, have a healthy environment within our homes and you know children should be allowed to run outside and play in the dirt and even if they get muddy and dirty that's okay um, then when it's time to eat obviously proper hygiene is you know practices are, are put into effect um, what else would you like to share about this so I think um when you're talking about major influences in terms of uh, the healthy gut uh, microbiome, there are several things that that, that we can do uh, or that we can think about um, when you're purchasing food from, say, market growers or when you're growing it yourself. Um, one of the key elements is is an understanding and appreciation for healthy soil. And, and what does healthy soil mean? It's it's almost a buzzword these days. and uh, what it means uh, to me and to a lot of us who are involved in in growing with biology, what it means is a a living, biologically diverse community of of microorganisms that take on responsible responsibility for nutrient cycling. So it's 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 actually very interesting when you look at healthy soil and healthy gut, two living systems teeming with biological diversity with strikingly similar functional uh, responsibilities for um, doing the nutrient cycling or digesting the food um, and, and taking responsibility for suppressing diseases and, and ensuring that um, the community uh, stays 
healthy and that um, that any pathogens that would enter the system are actually proactively eliminated. So when when soil healthy soil biology is allowed to flourish, plants benefit, people benefit, and this is nature's design. This is the way nature intended it. So I think um, really focusing on building healthy soil is a key element that we can um, that we can consider when trying to improve our our gut microbiome. And your company helps growers do just that, correct? Yes. In fact, um, you know there are ways that we can help growers assess the biological health of their soil through biological soil testing. Um, we look for the key microorganism groups that are um, that you would like to see in a healthy food web, and we quantify those um, through population statistics and provide that data back to farmers so that they can they can intervene in ways that um, that helps nurture that community um, to improve not only the quality of the food that they produce, but to lessen the the inputs that are needed to to grow successfully. So uh, when you have a, a healthy food web, you don't need to um, to be utilizing fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc. Uh, the soil food web takes care of that, um, takes care of the health of the soil and, and eliminates the needs for these external agents. And that has to be cost effective as well and labor reducing too, right? Absolutely. I mean, it takes money to purchase these, these, um, you know, pesticides and, and whatnot, and it takes uh, time to apply them. So, um, so you're absolutely right in the sense that it saves both time and money when you can establish a the food web who automatically does this without outside inputs. I mean, you're basically working with nature and allowing nature to be your army of uh, of workers in your soil take care of your plants well economics always drives the engine you know and i think coming up with these possibilities these testing this data analysis uh getting it back to the farmer showing them the economic savings uh, on several fronts will make a difference um are you right now working with large-scale farms or small smaller scale farms we work with the entire gamut of growers from, um, from farmers who are farming, you know, several acres, multiple acres to, to the home gardener. Anybody interested in really fostering and nurturing the, the soil food web and growing with biology. We have to start thinking differently about our soils if, um, if we are going to improve the quality of the food supply. Um, you know, there's, there's good data out there that, that, tells us that soils have become so so depleted by modern farming practices that that foods that, that were grown decades ago were actually much richer in vitamins and minerals than food grown today. So there's there's a lot of motivation to um, to change our practices, to treat soil um, as a living organism to minimize the um, ongoing use of both organic-based and synthetic chemical agents in the soil. In, in order for a healthy microbiome to survive, whether it's in our gut or in our soils, it, it needs to have an environment that's toxin-free. So, um, so that's why it's so important to focus first on the soil because you know toxins and residues um, they get on your food, end up, you know, you ingest that, you ingest the, those chemicals, and that has a negative impact on your microbiome, just as it has a negative impact on microbiology in the soil. So it's all interconnected, and the more we eliminate um, the use of, of these chemicals, the better off we're going to be as, as people, and the better off our plants are going to, going to be in, in growing in soils that are clean and healthy. Right, and my biggest concern is with the major players out there for injecting a seed with a chemical, systemic chemical to, to ward off a weed. They also put other adjuvants into that mix that we're not even aware of 
uh, for the most part in our society, there's antibiotics that get put into the mix, et cetera. So they inject it into the seed. They inject it into the soil when they apply it on the soil. So we're getting this huge amount of antibiotics from these other sources. Forget about our misuse of them in the medical field, but we're getting them in our food supply. So when you add all these factors up, I can see why our soils are not healthy, why they get tired, why nutrients are leached out of the soil. They're not uh, uptaken by our food. We eat that food. We're not getting all the minerals we think we are. Uh, we're also getting the residues from the chemicals, and that we know is starting to affect our biology. Dr. Stephanie Seneff out of MIT is doing some great work showing how the microbiome within our gut is seriously affected negatively yep. by the use of these systemic chemicals. So I applaud what you're doing and, and the education as well as the resources that you're offering to your community um, out in the, in the Midwest. Uh, what else would you like to add to this? I think, you know, the the other thing in terms of um, when you talk about proactive approaches to improving your gut microbiome, there are several things that, that people can do. Um, in addition, you know, not necessarily related to growing, but, but, um, but related to the types of food that you consume. And, and um, I think one of the most important things people can do is to put fiber center stage in their diet. Um, the, F, you know, the the requirements for the um, by the by the FDA in terms of uh, minimum amounts of daily intake of fiber. I think it's like 29 to 38 grams, and and what we're actually consuming is, is less than half of that. Most mm -hmm. American diet consist of about 15 grams of fiber. So when you think about, um, you know, what, what you can do to improve your, your microbiome, this is one of the, one of the key areas of focus. And, um, there's a group of foods, um, that, you know, that, that people can focus on eating, um, the fruits, the vegetables, uh, uh, healthy leg legumes and uh, nuts and so forth, uh, whole grains for sure. These um, these are the areas that that you want to you know focus on when you're at the grocery store, when you're at the the market gardener stand, and you add to that verification that the food was grown without chemicals, and you're really doing your microbiome a favor um, by not only increasing the fiber content, but you're increasing the fiber content with food that is that is clean and healthy and grown without chemical residues. Mm -hmm. So I think these are these are important strategies um, and and things that people can do right now to improve health. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when um, when your not your fiber intake is low is that the, it, it's not that your microbiome, you know, sort of shrivels and dies. What happens actually is your microbiome refocuses its uh, source of food intake, and um, the intestines actually secrete a layer of carbohydrate-rich mucus that, when there's not enough food source for your microbiome, they resort to eating this this mucosal um, food source that uh, is secreted by your intestines. And if there are prolonged periods where you're, you know, where there's a, a food shortage, so to speak, um, it can actually cause problems because your microbiome gets very close to your intestinal lining, which is a barrier that should not be crossed ever. So you don't want, micro, you know, you don't want bacterial microbes floating around your bloodstream. So uh, when, what happens is when when they get too close to breaching that protective layer between the intestinal wall and your bloodstream, it triggers this immune response. And that's where you get, you know, sources of inflammation and, and people can get really sick. Mm -hmm. So it's essential to make sure that, that people start thinking about how much diet, uh, dietary fiber they're consuming and really improving that consumption. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes us facing a serious illness to make those changes because in our society, 
uh, we have easily available food that's very low, and very poor substitute for fiber. Uh, and that's a change we have to personally make one choice at a time when we get out there. I know I'm on the road sometimes for eight hours. I always bring my food, my nuts, my drink uh, in the car because if I have to stop anywhere on the road, what are my choices? My choices are fast food that has no fiber, very little nutritional value, and it's very unsupportive of us. And yet it's convenient, you know, and that's the piece that we have to change in our society is can we make healthy food convenient, you know, going forward instead of just the unhealthy food. So you bring up some really great points and you and I both know as nurses <clears throat> that people have a lot of IBS out there, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Crohn's disease yes. is very prevalent. Those are ulcers, um, uh, GERD, uh, having acid reflux, those are really highly prevalent dysfunctions in our society today. And we can make a difference with some different uh, proactive choices, as you mentioned. Do you have any other tips you want to leave us with before we close? Um, my la I'd, I'd like to close with my, my last and final tip, which is um, if, if you grow, grow with biology. And uh, that's kind of my mantra and, and uh, the most important consideration, I think, that people who, uh, who are interested in growing their own food, not only will it, it benefit um, the quality and nutritional density of your food, but it's also going to help you minimize um, the requirements for additional inputs, um, those toxic chemicals that we mentioned, because the biology will proactively, um, you know, provide... Um, protection um, from diseases and pathogens and, and, and whatnot that can attack your food. So um, so I personally, um, you know, grow with biology and recommend that my, you know, the folks that I work with and the farmers that I support um, do the same. And we're starting to see a pretty significant shift in momentum. People are paying more attention. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift in many, many ways. And um, as we as we begin to support with good data, I think we're going to see um, some significant progress in this area going forward. Could you give us uh, three um, ideas for biology? Are you talking about composting, gr you know, grass leaves, uh, leaves, um, seaweed? Uh, what else? Is there anything else you want to add to that besides kitchen scraps? <laughs> yes, composting is um, composting with biocomplete, you know, creating biocomplete compost, meaning that it's not just, you know, putrefied organic material. It's, it's um, you know, turned appropriately. It's, it's maintained in an aerobic condition so that it contains the beneficial microorganisms that are going to, to improve your soil. So composting is a big one. Um, eliminating tillage in soils is another um, the, the microbiology sets up their housing in your soil. So every time you dig it up, you're basically, you know, functionally creating a tornado and, and destroying their habitat. So by, by eliminating tillage, eliminating the turning over of your soil, you're protecting that habitat and allowing the, that microbiology to, to thrive and in the housing communities that they've developed, so to speak. Um, and the third one is, um, you know, we're seeing more and more cover cropping. So, uh, you know, making sure that you never have bare soil, that you have it covered, either with um, what we call cover crops, which is beneficial crops that um, and, and plants that grow in between your your vegetables and, and your your cash crops, so to speak. Um, you know, maintaining a uh, the root systems of some plants so that the microorganisms are constantly active, developing, working, um, that they're not allowed uh, to go idle is essential to maintaining that um, functional soil food web. Mm, those are great tips. And what we have found in our personal backyard garden, we have about 800 square feet of garden beds, is that it's a lot less work. Yep. It's a lot Absolutely. less work. We got ourselves a little electric mower. We mow in the paths, but all the root systems are kept. 
we keep that diversity in there, we don't pull out those weeds at all to try to grow that fungal network from one bed to the other, to the other, to the other. And we're excited about these changes because it's easier. It's easier, but it's also rewarding because we trust our food is going to be really nutritious doing these things. Yes, and, and that's it sounds like a wonderful plan. I bet you've also noticed that um, as you as you work um, to advance your garden that you're seeing more pollinators, you're seeing more beneficial insects come to your garden. Uh, the birds, first you see, you generally first you see the birds come back and then the beneficial insects. I mean, it's been years since I've seen a praying mantis and when I started um, this method of, of growing myself, my, I mean, I see, I see the praying mantis come to my garden on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the honeybees um, are pollinating my fruits so that I get higher um, pollination rates and, and more yield. So it's, it's all interconnected and, and very beneficial for the environment. It is, and it's a win for them because the insects and the critters and the microbes and the fungi are doing what they came here to do. They're great teachers for us, and I think that's part of the message I want to get across with these podcast series is that nature's actually raising its voice right now to be our teacher because we really need, we really need her guidance. We've really kind of messed things up in some ways. And yeah. I, I really love the positive things that folks like yourself are doing to make a difference. Thank you. Well, Kimberly, it's been great. I want to thank you again. I want to thank you for all your practical tips and advice, also your explanations. They're very clear, and I hope people start to really get comfortable with the words microbiome and the biome of the soil, the biome of our intestine, and how related we are. So thank you for that. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, this is Judith Dreyer, and I'm the author of At the Gardenscape book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, Goodreads, and more. I'd like to remind all of you that a transcript is available for each podcast. Please like and share them. Let's support each other and get the word out. Remember, now is the time for practical action and profound interchange so we value our world once again. Enjoy your day.